Hello, and welcome to Scattered Terrain. My name is Meredith, and today I'm going to be showing you how I make my statues. To make the statues, you're going to need some air dry clay and a little cup of water. For sculpting tools, I like using a crochet hook and this plastic knife. You're also going to need PVA glue and XPS foam. You're also going to need Mod Podge and whatever paint colors you're using. I'm also going to use some screws to add weight and I like to keep a mini on hand for that starting scale. For this particular project, I knew that I wanted to make a series of statues that were all as close to identical as I could. So first I made my size template for both the body and the head, and I keep them separate so that I can use them as reference when I'm making my balls of clay. I like to make each statue on its own little individual square of parchment paper. That makes it much easier to move them around and keeps everything cleaner in the end. So starting with the body, I'm gonna make a ball of air dry clay that's about the same size as my body template. And if I put my clay here, you can see that the ball I'm using is just about 7 eighths of an inch diameter. And then rolling the ball between my hands, I'm going to gently form it into the shape of the body. Now you can see here, I'm gonna take the fingers of my upper hand and I'm going to cup them slightly so that the center finger is a little bit raised compared to the two side fingers. This way, as I rub my hands back and forth with the ball between them, it's gonna taper the ball to have a thicker midsection. And I'm just gonna take a minute and use my fingers to smooth out any cracks in the clay. Roll it together a little bit more, make sure it's the size and shape that I want, and make sure that the body that I'm making is gonna be all one fairly solid piece. And then I'm going to take that tapered tube that we've made and press it down into the center of the parchment paper. And using my pinkies to hold it up, I'm going to use my fingers to do a pressing spinning motion on the clay. And then I want my statues to loom over the player characters. So I'm going to just bend his torso forward a little bit. Do a quick comparison with my template here. Yeah, this one's a little bit bigger, but that's close enough for me. And then I'm going to grab my plastic knife and I'm going to score into the clay at the top of the torso where it's going to attach to the head. By doing this we create a much rougher surface area for the clay to be able to grip into itself and the final bond between pieces will be a lot stronger. Next I'm going to get a ball of air dry clay the same size as my head template and laying it on that measuring line you can see that it makes about a half an inch diameter ball. And then when I'm rolling this ball between my hands, I'm going to make sure that I'm cupping it in the very center of my palms. I want to make this a very round ball. We're not going for a tube on this one. And again, I'm just going to work it with my fingers to make sure that I've eliminated any major cracks. And I'm also going to start gently pinching forward to form the nose of my statue. So one end of the ball, I'm just going to make into a nice cone. Then I'm going to grab my crochet hook and holding it with the hook facing down, I use this to make gentle indents on either side of the nose to create the brow ridge and the bridge of the nose. Then turning the crochet hook so that the hook is now facing sideways instead of down, I'm going to poke the point straight into the center of that indent, creating the eye socket. And make sure you flip it around when you do the other side. Then as a final touch, I'm gonna take the very forward end of that hook and press it straight into the clay right below the nose, forming an indent for the mouth. And then just as I did with the torso, I'm also going to score up the bottom of the head where it's going to touch the body. And as you can see here, I've dug the grooves deep enough that when I now add a drop of water on my finger and touch it into the clay, when I squish these two pieces together and give them a gentle twist, the two pieces of clay along with that water really sort of blend together back into being one piece of clay and it forms a much stronger bond than if you press them together dry. And then just take a moment and make sure that the head is sitting on the body the way that you want it, that it's at the right angle and tilt for your finished statue. And you don't have to worry too much about any visible cracks in the air dry clay. Considering that this is an old worn statue that we're making, any cracks in the clay are just going to be added weathering that's really going to be beneficial to the final product. Now if you're making a bunch of statues at once, this is where you'll go down the line and finish this first step for all of your statues. By the time you're done with the last statue, this first one should be dry enough to move on to the next step. So we're going to grab some more of our air dry clay. In order to keep my air dry clay fresh as long as possible, I like to take a chunk that I think is going to be big enough for my whole project out of my main bag and keep most of my clay completely sealed. Then I take that working chunk and wrap it in a damp paper towel that I then wrap in saran wrap. So I'm going to grab a good sized chunk off of my clay. I'm going to roll it into a rough ball shape. 
and then using my fingers I'm going to pinch this out into a nice thin oval. You want to make this as thin as you can without it starting to break on you because this is going to be fabric in your statue. I find spinning it between my fingers as I pinch helps me keep it very even. And then once you think you've got your clay to a good thickness, grab that plastic knife and we're going to cut a nice long curve off of the entire bottom edge. So I'm going to use my dried body here as a measuring guide to make sure that I'm cutting my robe to the right height. Just make sure to push your thumb into the clay right there at his neck. Then come back with that plastic knife and cut a second, slightly more gentle scallop for the neckline. And then you want your neckline to be tighter than the bottom of the robe, so I'm going to cut two angled pieces off of either end of this curve. Then I'm just going to roll my scraps up into a ball to try and keep them from drying out too quickly. And then I'm going to tap my finger along the cut edges of the clay to help soften any obvious tool marks. And if you feel any thick places while you're doing this, just give it a little bit more of a tap. All right, and then we're just going to center the body on the robe and wrap both sides around him, giving a firm but gentle pressure with your thumb into the clay to help everything bond. And then as a final touch, set him back onto his parchment and pinch firmly around the neck, making sure that it really tapers in. Then using that plastic knife, we're going to score into both shoulders where we're going to be attaching the arms. And he's got a little bit too much in the back here, so I'm just gonna pinch down his neck a little further make sure this looks good and then grabbing my little pile of scrap clay here i'm going to take a much smaller sized chunk and we're going to make the arms now because he's in a robe i'm going to cheat a little bit and make both arms one piece that connects in the middle as if his hands were tucked inside his big sleeves and then just to make sure the rest of this clay doesn't dry out i'm going to tuck the rest of my scrap away let's just move him up here and so I'm going to roll this piece between my hands using that same raised middle finger technique to create a tube that has a thicker middle than either side. And then I'm going to continue to accentuate that by pinching it between my fingers here. And make sure to spin while you're pinching so that you get it nice and even all the way down. All right, and I really want there to be a lot more in the middle than on either end. And then I also want to make sure that I press this flat. I don't want the hands to come too far forward in front of the body just smooth out any major big cracks. Again, little cracks are a good thing, but I don't want any that are too big. And I'm just gonna create this stretched triangle shape. And you know, this arm is just a little bit too big. I'm gonna pinch off some of the extra here and reshape it. Oh, and a little bit more off of this side. Let's give it a quick test fit, see how it looks. Yeah, that's perfect. So then we just need to divide our two sleeves. So I'm gonna grab that plastic knife again and on the back of the arms where they're going to be attaching to the statue, I'm going to find my center line. And then starting with that center line, I'm going to gently rock the blade over the top of the hands and down the front of the sleeves, wrapping around the bottom to the back. Now to make absolutely sure that these don't break off later, I'm gonna be switching from water to PVA glue on my score marks. So we're gonna put just a little dot of glue on each side, and then I'm gonna position my arms where I want them on the front and press both shoulders into place. And then just make sure that the hands are tipping down and where you want them to be. And once you're sure everything is where you want it, just hold it with firm pressure for a few moments to make sure everything is locked in. And once again, take this step and work down your whole line of statues with it. I'm just gonna clean up some of my clay residue here. Always easier to clean up things like this with a damp towel while they're wet than trying to chip them off later once they're dry. There we go. All right, now that he's dry again and I'm sure nothing's gonna fall off, we're gonna move on to putting on his hood. Now I want to make sure that my statue's hoods come to a nice point in the back, so I'm gonna actually build up the shape of the head to that point first. So I'm going to put just a little bit of PVA glue on top of his head, and then grabbing a little bit of air dry clay that's about a quarter of an inch across, I'm going to just flatten that down a little and smooth it onto the very top of his head, giving him a nice point. And I'm just going to do a quick little blending with my finger to smooth the new clay over the dry clay, and that line almost completely disappears. Do a quick check, make sure I don't have anything crooked. All right, yeah, that's the silhouette that I want him to have. So far, he's looking good. And then I'm going to grab a piece of clay that's about a half an inch in diameter, and I'm going to start flattening the ball into a disc, just the same way that we did with the ropes doing that pinching and spinning motion between my fingers. And again, you don't want to keep it a perfect circle. You do want to make it go a little bit oval. 
And then once again, I'm gonna just put a little bit of white glue on the very top of his head. Give my clay circle a quick little once over, pinching it between my fingers, making sure it's as good and smooth as I can make it. And then you want to position the hood so that a little bit of each side is going to overlap onto the shoulders and make sure that they are locked in place. And then from there, you're going to gently pinch together towards the back, creating a little bit of a flap sticking out. And then you want to press that flap straight towards the back of the head, causing it to flatten out into a sort of a triangular shape. Then coming back to the front, you wanna use your fingers to tease the shape of the hood down around the face, making a couple of nice deep folds. I went a little far forward onto the face of this guy, but you get the basic idea. Then to make the plinth that the statue stands on, I'm gonna use XPS foam. So for this, I'm gonna grab my Proxon wire cutter as that is the fastest, easiest way I can cut the foam. If you don't have a Proxon wire cutter, you can do most of this by hand with a craft knife. You just might have to move a little slower and more carefully as some of these cuts are quite thin. And I'm just gonna grab my guide bar and get that into place here. Make sure I get good, straight, clean cuts. Now we're going to make the center of our plinths out of a three quarters of an inch cube. So I'm gonna set my wire depth to three quarters of an inch. And I'm gonna cut a couple of strips out of this one inch foam. Then I'm gonna run the strips through going the other direction to make sure that I don't have a one inch by three quarter strip, but a full three quarter by three quarter strip. Then I'm gonna come back a third time with the strips and cut them off into cubes. You're gonna need one cube for every statue that you're making. And then I'll just get these guys out of the way. Then for these statues, I wanna do a decorative facing on it. So I'm going to shorten this to a half an inch and cut another strip out. And again, you wanna make sure you turn it and run it both ways to get it a half an inch in each direction. And then I'm going to move my block out of the way because this next bit's gonna be sort of a free hand. I'm gonna give myself a fairly square bottom and then I'm going to cut this strip of foam down to a more manageable length, something that's shorter than the arm of my Proxon. Because for the next step, I'm going to stand it on its end and then I'm going to hold each corner close to the hot wire and very gently use the heat to melt out little scalloped corners. And as you can see here, that leaves us with a very nice decorative shape. Now, because this is sometimes a difficult process to control, I'm gonna go ahead and do this two more times and then compare and see which one I like the best. Then we're gonna move that guard back to an eighth of an inch and cut thin slices off of a one inch by one inch strip. These will make the top and bottom of our statue plinths, so you're gonna need two of these for each statue that you're making. Here's a rough idea of what it's going to look like. Then for our final decorative pieces, we're going to move the guard until it's a sixteenth of an inch away from the wire, and then we'll just cut delicate thin shavings off of one end of these decorative pieces, making our facings. Now because I'm putting one on each side of the plinth, I'm going to need four of these for every statue. And to give you a bit of a closer look, this is what you wind up with. So we can put this guy away. Now I want these to look like stone, so I'm gonna grab my handy dandy aluminum foil ball, and I'm going to press it into anywhere that's going to be an exposed face on the XPS. So for the center columns, that means hitting four of the six sides, cause we're not gonna see the top and bottom. And when I'm texturing these thin top and bottom pieces, I like to keep them stacked together while I'm texturing the edges. That way it gives them strength and I have less chance of breaking one. And for the pieces that are on top, you need to cover most all of them with the stone texture, but for the halves that are gonna be on the bottom, you really only need to do the edges that are gonna be visible. Now I want my end result to be as stable as possible, so what I like to do is take a good heavy screw and put it into the base of all of the three quarter inch cubes before I glue the bottoms on. Do a quick check, make sure that you're not drilling it into one of the textured sides. And then using a screwdriver, just put it in place like you would screwing into anything else. And just do a quick check to make sure it sits flush. And do the same with all of your statues. Now when I glue the bottoms on later, these screw heads won't be visible. Then I'm gonna grab the bottom half of my pedestals and I'm going to put a little dot of white glue into the very center. Then keeping the screw on the side that's down, I'm going to center my cube over the bottom and press it firmly into place. Once I've been pressing it for a moment, I can pick it up off of the table and flip it over and use a few straight pins to really give a good solid connection between the two pieces. Just make sure that you're aiming around the center because otherwise you'll run straight into that screw and it won't go in. 
and because this is the bottom and you're never gonna see it, I go ahead and just push them all the way flush, and then I leave these in place. That way I have less chance of the bottom breaking off later. And then do this same step down your whole line of statues. And because we're trying to avoid that screw in the center, sometimes you'll find that you do accidentally poke out the side of one of your cubes. You don't have to worry about this, that's gonna be completely covered by those little facings that we cut off earlier. So if this happens to you, don't panic, just back the straight pin out, readjust your angle, and push it back into place. Then grabbing the tops of the plinths, we're going to do the same step, but in reverse. You're gonna have that same little dot of white glue in the very center, then you're gonna pick up that first piece, center it over the top, press down firmly, and then on these, I like to lay them on their side to make sure that I'm getting a good even lineup so that the top and bottom aren't slanted off each other. Once I'm sure that everything is straight and exactly where I want it, I'm gonna come back and put two straight pins in the top as well. But this time, because I don't have to worry so much about that screw, I'm gonna go much closer to the center. That way I can leave these in place as well and they'll be covered by the statue. And then just take a moment to check for any white glue seeping out the sides and clean it up with your finger. Then follow this step down your line of statues, making sure that you've got everything square and lined up so that you don't have a crooked statue pillar later. Then getting those two straight pins close in towards the center and pressing them down until they're flush with the top. Yeah, they're looking good already. Now if you want to, you can leave them at this step and they'll look perfectly fine. But personally, I like going the extra mile, so I'm gonna add the decorative facings on these. Now the aluminum foil can sometimes rip through thinner, more delicate foam, so I'm going to grab one of my ballast texturing tools here and just very gently roll over all of my pieces. Then I'm going to set them all with their textured side facing down and come along and put a little drop of white glue on the back of each piece. Then I'm going to pick them up in pairs and rub their two glued sides together. This gives me a nice thin coating of PVA all over the back of both pieces. Then taking one at a time, I'm going to line it up with one side of one of my statue plinths and drop it into place. And then you have a few minutes to wiggle it around and move it with your fingers to line it up and make sure that it's centered. Then grab the other piece and do the same thing with it as well. Now when I'm putting on the decorative faces, I like to work back and forth between two plinths. That way I can put on a front and side to one, and then put a front and side on the next piece. That way they all have a little bit of time to dry before I come back and touch them again. That way I have less of a chance of accidentally moving one of my first pieces while I'm pushing the next one on. Then going back to the first plinth again, we're gonna rub our two remaining pieces together, and then line them up with the two remaining blank faces. If you're enjoying this video, give it a like. That helps YouTube suggest it to more people. And with all four decorative faces in place, I'm gonna set these guys aside to dry. To give you a comparison, here's one of the statue plinths plain, and here's one of them with the decorative facing. Both styles of plinths work perfectly well. It's just a question of whether or not it's worth it to you to put in that extra bit of time. Now our final step in the assembly is to glue the statue to the plinth. So using our PVA glue, we're going to put a nice, healthy coating all over the bottom of the statue, paying special attention to the areas where there are cracks between the robe and the body to allow the glue to sort of seep up into those cracks. Then using a pencil, I'm going to gouge out some of the surface of the foam to make sure that I have a good connection point for my glue. And then I'm going to just adjust my statue over the top of the plinth until it's exactly where I want it to be. And then when I have it where I want it, I give it a gentle downward pressure, and then we can just set him aside to dry. Once the statues are completely dry, I give them a good healthy going over with a coating of Mod Podge. Now for this coating of Mod Podge, I like to keep water handy so that I can be keeping my brush damp between applications. Having the Mod Podge be a little bit watery helps it to really run into all of these cracks and crevices on the clay, and it also helps keep it from being too thick of a coating and building up its own texture. Once I've given a thorough coating to the top half of the statue, I move down the line to the next ones to give that top half time to dry. Once I've gotten to the end of my line of statues and circle back, he's dry enough to the touch that I can now pick him up and handle him so that I can paint Mod Podge all over the bottom half as well. I find that coating both the clay and the foam with the Mod Podge helps to give a uniform texture over the entire statue, and it really helps add stability in the long term. And just make sure as you're going through, if you notice any Mod Podge built up really thick in some places, just go back over it with your damp brush and pull off that excess. 
and make sure to tip them up and get the underside as well. That way all of the foam is coated and those pins get firmly locked in place. Then I'm gonna set him aside to dry again while I go down the rest of the line. Once the Mod Podge is dry, it's time for our base coat of paint. For these statues, I'm still painting in my aged alabaster marble color scheme, so once again I'm going to be using raw sienna as my base coat. And because of all of the cracks and crevices on this sculpture, I'm going to do the same thing I did with the Mod Podge and keep a cup of water handy. That way I can continually keep my brush damp. And just give the entire statue a good thorough coating with your base color. And I do the same trick here of stopping at the midway point and moving down the line and then circling back to the first statue when he's had some time to dry. That way I can pick him up and hold him by the parts I've already painted without having it come off on my fingers. So I'm using that same raw sienna with a cup of water nearby to just make sure I give a good thorough coating to all of the little nooks and crannies inside the statue. I want to especially pay close attention to getting inside the hood with this base color. And with the statue, I want to make sure that every once in a while I go back over my brush strokes with a sort of stippling motion. This helps to erase those long lines of the brush and give instead sort of a stony texture. And because I am using craft paints, you don't always get full coverage with the first coat, especially when you're watering it down a little bit. So once that first coat is dry, feel free to go back over it one or two more times until you have a good solid base coat to work from. Once that base coat is dry, we get to move on to dry brushing. For that, I'm going to be using light mocha. So I'm going to grab a nice beat up brush and work a good amount of paint into the bristles. And then I'm going to work about half of that paint back off into the paper towel because this dry brushing is really more of an over brushing. And I wanna start with the hard to reach areas and use sort of a tapping stippling motion to make sure that I'm getting paint into all of the hardest to reach areas first. Then once I'm sure I have that covered, I can come back and fill in the bits that I missed out in the center. And I always like to make sure that I tip up and get the underside too. That way if for any reason these statues get knocked over on the table or the players decide to start tipping statues over in game, the underside of the statue doesn't suddenly glaringly show you that it's not finished. And then continuing with that stippling motion, I'm just going to make sure to cover the entire statue. Again, focusing on those hard to reach difficult areas first and then coming back through and covering out the main flat zones when you're done. If you start with the main flat zones and then come back to the difficult areas, sometimes you find that you wind up really overdoing it in some places. And then as a final touch, I do one nice strong heavy downstroke over all of the exposed edges to really make sure that they get that nice light wearing. This really helps to sell the age of the statue. And we'll give him a quick once over here, make sure there aren't any spots we missed. Yeah, there's a little bit too much of that raw sienna coming through here. I'm just going to cover that a little more. And a touch here on the back as well. All right, yeah, that's looking good. So we'll just set him aside to dry, go down the line with everybody. And then once you're sure that the paint's dry and won't wash off, it's time for wash. I made the wash using a burnt sienna craft paint and water with a one part paint to 10 parts water ratio. Then I'm just gonna get a good grip on the head of my statue and fully submerge it into the wash. Once he's all the way covered, I'm gonna bring him out, give him a little bit of a shake over the top and then tap him off on paper towel to make sure that I don't have excess wash pooling up underneath. Then I'm going to take a damp paintbrush and go around and just touch it to any pools of wash that are too thick. And they'll immediately soak the wash right up off the statue. He should look something like this. Then just do everyone on the line and set them aside to dry. Once they're dry, we're going to pull that light mocha back out one more time. And this time our dry brush is going to be a true light dry brush. So you're still going to work a fair amount of paint into that brush, but then you're going to work almost all of the paint out onto the paper towel. Then with dry brushing, I always do a quick test run on the palm of my hand just to make absolutely sure I know how much paint is in the brush. And then just as we did before with the overbrushing, we're going to start with a stippling motion into all of the hardest to reach places. Anytime that you feel that you're really starting to have to push harder to get the paint to transfer, Go ahead and go back to your palette and load more paint on. Wipe most of it off onto that paper towel. Test it again into the palm of your hand. 
And then when you know that your brush is fresh and you're going to have the most paint on it, I like to do a quick sort of all over stipple on the statue so that if there's any bits that are more intense with paint, they're spread out as more of an overall texture to the stone as opposed to looking like paint spots. And then I want to do downward strokes all over the statue because now we're showing where the light bounces off of the edges. So you don't really want to do any strokes from the bottom going up. You want to really focus on just going from the top down. And you also want to hit the edges of the platform that the statue is standing on. And I really like to make sure that I get those folds around the face of the cloak and the top of the arms. And do a quick once over, make sure we got a good downward stroke on all of our sharp edges. All right, that is looking good. And once more, just to give you a quick comparison back to a previous step, here's one of the statues that I've washed but haven't dry brushed yet, to give you a sort of a before and after to let you decide for yourself whether or not you want to go through the final dry brushing. And with that final dry brushing step, our statues are complete. As always, at this point I do take my statues outside and give them a final spray coating with a matte varnish for protection, but that's entirely optional. If you're enjoying my videos so far and would like to see some behind the scenes content, consider joining my Patreon page. It's the best way to help support me in making more videos, plus you get to see behind the scenes content and work in progress shots as I'm making my next episode. If you'd like to know more, I've got a link in the description down below. And on that note, I would like to give a huge and hearty thank you to my first three patrons. You guys are the absolute best. You really help me stay motivated to keep making more videos. Thank you. But enough with the mushy stuff. Let's go see what our statues are going to look like on the table. After a few minutes of investigation, you find the hidden trigger. As the sound of rattling chains fills the air, one of the statues slides to the side, revealing a secret chamber. As you gaze at the hidden staircase within, the sound of chains continues. A monstrous chain golem steps into the opening, blocking your path forward. Roll for initiative. And so there you have it. That is how I make my statues. Tune in for the next video. I'm going to be showing you how I make my cages. Stick around. Thanks for spending some of your time here with me at Scattered Terrain. If you liked that video, hit the like button. If you want to see more, hit that subscribe button, and I'll see you next time.